The year is 2038, it's January 19th at 3.14 in the morning. It's been a fairly uneventful night, but you decide to stay up all night to work on a presentation you have due in the afternoon. But you notice something really strange as another 8 seconds begins to pass. Suddenly, it's the 13th of December 1901 at 8.44pm and 52 seconds. Clearly something is amiss here, but it's not just on this system. Every computer you can find says the exact same time. And you notice that some of your applications begin to behave really strangely. And then you look outside and you notice that nuclear power plants are exploding. The world ends and all of humanity is dead. Is what I would say if engineers were just sitting on their butts and letting everything implode. So you've almost certainly heard of Y2K. Now, a lot of people think that Y2K just never happened. It did happen, but all of the engineers knew it was going to happen and mitigated the issue. So a lot of early computer dates were stored in not the most sensible way. Rather than storing a year as a four-digit number, they decide to only store the last two numbers. So what do you think would happen if something relies on date sorting like uh, a mortgage payment or a car registration or basically any other sort of database when you go to the year 2000? Well, suddenly 2000 looks exactly the same as 1900. There were still some systems that were affected, but due to the mitigations put in place like storing dates correctly, basically the issue was nowhere near as bad as it was hyped up to be. And this is a very similar issue to the year 2038 problem. So I just want to confirm something. Everybody knows that history started at January 1st, 1970. At least that's when it started in the context of computing. This is known as the Unix Epoch of Unix time. So Unix time is defined as a number of seconds after that date at midnight. So if I do something like a billion seconds after that date, it's going to give us this date in 2001. Now Unix time is used to store the time on a Unix-like and Unix-based system, whatever you want to call it. So the BSD variants which are used to power many of your game consoles, with the exception of the stuff that Microsoft uses, because they just run Windows on it, is used to power many of your car computers, which in many cases are running either BSD or a Linux variant. It's used for macOS, and in my case, it's used for Linux. And Linux is a pretty big problem, because Linux is used to power most of the web, in the form of web servers and database servers and things like this. Now why it's specifically set to January 1st 1970 is a whole nother video, just for the sake of this, except that that is when it is set to. Now traditionally this number is stored as a signed 32-bit integer. Now when we're talking about an unsigned 32-bit integer, that will store a number from 0 to 4,294,697,250 but when we say signed integer, this means it supports negatives. So instead of that range, basically we cut it in half. So it supports a range of minus 2,147,483,648 to 2,147,483,647. Now the reason we need a signed integer is time didn't start in 1970, so in some cases it may be useful to be able to go backwards some number of years, because let's say you have a computer system that didn't start in 1970, or maybe you want to backdate stuff to an earlier date, like uh, a death record for example. People died before 1970, and if you want to keep a log of that, you probably want to go back some number of years. But this is where the problems start to happen. I said this number has a range. So this is the top of the range, and this is going to be the bottom of the range. And you might notice those are the two dates I gave at the start. 
and this would cause the exact same problem that Y2K would have caused. If you try to make a date after that point, it is going to wrap all the way back down to the bottom, and now you have entries that should be newer, but are saying they're older, and dates just completely fall apart, and databases make no sense at all. This is known as an integer overflow bug. And to understand why this can actually happen, we need to have a bit of a basic binary lesson. Now, binary is made up of ones and zeros, but ones and zeros don't inherently have value. The thing that gives them value is an encoding, a way to use them. Now, when we're talking about a 32-bit integer, it doesn't matter if it's signed or unsigned, this means you need 32 bits of data. So in this case, we have four blocks of eight bits. Each of these numbers is a bit. The reason we break them down into blocks of eight is eight bits is a byte. And this is just an easy way to write them. And when you are reading a binary number, you start from the right hand side. When a bit is set to zero, that bit is worth zero. When a bit is set to one, it is set to two to the power of that position, starting at zero. So we set the first number to one. This is worth two to the power of zero, which is one. The second position is two to the power of one, worth two. The next one is four, and then eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, so on and so forth. Now in an unsigned integer, all of the bits are handled the same way. In a signed integer, this leftmost bit is handled slightly differently. This represents the sign of the number, either positive or negative. But there's not just different ways to encode general binary, there are even different ways to encode an integer. So what you are seeing is two sets of ranges for three different encoding methods. So this is the range of signed magnitude. This is the top of the range, and this is the bottom of the range. This is also for a signed integer. And the bottom set is for one's complement and two's complement. Now these methods do work slightly differently and have a slightly different human readable range, but when they're represented as binary, at least for these specific numbers, look exactly the same. Now, what do you think happens if you try to add one to a binary number that is already completely filled with ones? Well, there's only one thing that can happen. You roll all the way back to the start and restart the number. And that's actually really obvious with sign magnitude. The only thing left to flip is the sign here, and then it's all ones and back to the bottom of the range. So what is the solution then? It's not stopping the integer overflowing, it's just make the number bigger. So instead of using a 32-bit integer, we are now using a 64-bit signed integer. And that number looks like this. It is a lot bigger. And I'll show you how big a bit later. Now, for most users, this generally is an issue when it comes to your operating system or your CPU, because 64-bit versions of these have been available for a very long time. In some cases, you can't even run a 32-bit operating system like on macOS, for example. The main issues are on the software side with software not being properly developed with 2038 in mind. And this is why there are still problems being patched this year. For example, MariaDB in 2038 wouldn't launch. For Python 2 with CPython, it wouldn't compile. Some tests in memcache just weren't behaving correctly. Borg backups wouldn't work properly because date stamps just didn't line up like they should be. And then random rsync tests are also failing. Now, as you can see, a lot of these issues have been addressed, but some of them are still open. And this is only scratching the surface of the 2038 problems that still exist. A lot of major projects still have giant lists of these, and we are in the range. It's only 16 years until 2038. We are in the range where systems are going to be deployed today that are basically not going to be touched until past that year. Problems that still exist need to be fixed. If you're a developer who's just making some random application, do a test build past that time in 2038. If problems start to arise, please do address them.
if you really don't think a system is going to be deployed and then not touched for 16 plus years, just keep in mind that until this year, Japan was still actively using floppy disks in their government. It is only now they are finally starting to phase this out. A lot of the time, if things work, it's just going to keep going until it no longer works anymore. That's not just in government, that's in a lot of industries. Whether we're talking about manufacturing, banking, finance, aerospace, medical, defense, public transport, postal, telecoms, maritime, tax organizations, anything you can think of, there are going to be systems deployed that are going to have problems and hopefully those problems get detected before things actually become a problem. Or hopefully a lot of the things they're already using have been patched and it's just not an issue. Now, like with Y2K, I'm not particularly concerned of, you know, horrible nuclear meltdowns and the world falling apart, because like that situation, engineers are fully aware about the 2038 problem and have been addressing this for quite a while now. Most of the systems have been dealt with, and there are going to be some systems that do break and are going to make the news after that date happens, but it's not going to be this worldwide disaster. So let's redo that bit from the start of the video and demonstrate how big this range actually is. Because even with a 64-bit integer, the problem technically does still exist, it's just kind of a non-issue. So, the year is 292,277,026,596. It is December 4th at 3.30 in the afternoon. Now, that date is about 22 times the estimated age of the universe. So, I think we might be fine. And if there are still any systems from today running at that point, maybe then we try out 128-bit numbers. So are you worried about the 2038 problem, or are you in the same camp as me where basically you expect most things to be dealt with by then, but if you do see problems, you should still report them? I would love to know. So if you like this video, remember to go and like the video, and if you really like the video, and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, go check out my Patreon, subscribe to the pay link in the description down below. I've got a podcast called Tech Over T. I've got a gaming channel called Brody Robertson Plays. That's going to be it for me, and I'm out.